Today is my 30th birthday and to celebrate I've done a few things. One, I've grown my hair, it's longer than it's been in forever. And the other is to grow a beard and moustache for the first time. And this has taken me literally about a month and I think it still looks terrible. So I'll just be back in one second. Ugh, I feel so much better. Okay, so the third and final thing I thought I'd do since it's my 30th birthday is talk about 30 things I've learnt about the climate in 30 years. So without further ado, let's give it a go. The first couple of things are things I think pretty much everyone noticed when they were little. The first is just that there was weather, that there was heat coming from the sun, uh, that there could be a cold wind, that there's rain, just noticing these things in the world around me. The second, a couple of years later probably, was that there are patterns to this, and I didn't know at the time, but that's what climate is. So for example, uh, summer is always hotter than winter. Some parts of the world are hotter than others. Uh, I didn't get all these patterns right, so for example, I was sure that all Sundays were sunny, and it turns out that that's not true. It was a few years after that, I would say I was probably about 10, so that would have been in about 1997, that I heard about climate change for the first time. I think a teacher mentioned it to me, mentioned that we're pumping things into the atmosphere, which are making the world get hotter. I don't really remember because I didn't really think about it much at the time, but I remember being told at about 10. It wasn't until I was about 14 that I actually learnt what was going on with this. I learned about the greenhouse effect and the idea of carbon dioxide trapping extra heat in the Earth's atmosphere. I probably learned that in geography class. Um, at the same time, I learned something which wasn't connected to climate change, or at least not yet, which was that I love photography. I love using cameras and taking photos. And of course, that was really important later on in life. One thing that's been really fun for me writing this list is working out that I learned some actually quite complex ideas uh, while I was still in school. So one of them was the, uh, the idea of feedbacks. So feedbacks are things which could either um, increase climate change, they could serve to amplify the warming we'd see from carbon dioxide, or they could cancel it out a bit, positive and negative feedbacks. Uh, so I didn't learn which one outweighed the other, but even that idea was quite cool to learn at 15. At about 16 or 17, I learned properly about nuclear fusion power, uh, the idea to create energy using the same technique that the sun uses. And I just thought this was awesome and would definitely fix climate change. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna be a physicist and I'm gonna solve climate change by sorting out nuclear fusion. So then I went to university to study physics and almost straight away I met this guy who was probably the first like proper climate skeptic I'd met. And what was really interesting about this situation was uh, we were both really surprised to meet each other. I don't think I'd really understood that there are people who really, really didn't believe in climate change until that point. And he really didn't know that there are people who really did believe in climate change at that point. At the same time as I studied physics and I learned really cool stuff about special relativity and about quantum physics, I realised that I loved talking about science to people. I loved uh, talking to my friends who studied English literature or law and trying to get them to understand how the tiniest things in the universe work. And I sort of ended up enjoying that more than I enjoyed actually learning about the stuff. At the same time, I realised it wasn't just my friends I liked talking to, I really liked presenting. Um, I did student radio for the first time. It was nothing to do with science, nothing to do with climate change. The show was called Adam and the Wolf. Um, and I, it was so much fun, just like getting on the airwaves every week. Just after that, I made a friend with uh, someone and he was vegetarian. And I asked him why he was vegetarian. At the time, I loved eating steaks and burgers and things. Um, and he said he was vegetarian for environmental reasons. And it never occurred to me that the food you ate had a connection to the environment. That might seem silly now, but at the time it was like, oh wow, I'd never thought of that. I also found out about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report at about that time, um, and hearing about how it worked and just how confident they were that humans were causing global warming was a real revelation. Um, 
I also heard something that made me really uncomfortable about that time, which was the idea that every little helps probably isn't the best attitude. We need to cut carbon dioxide a lot. And so what helps is actually everyone doing quite a lot. Just after that, I realized just how hard it is for the world to do a lot. Um, I hadn't really thought about climate change politics before, but then the Copenhagen climate meeting happened and ended in pretty much complete failure. And that was quite disheartening at a time when I was just starting to really think about climate change more actively. I then think I watched a TED talk, maybe it was by Bill Gates, and he, I learned two things from that. The first was that carbon dioxide sticks around in the atmosphere for ages. Um, so that any carbon dioxide we pump up that ends up in the atmosphere, it's gonna be there for a long time. And what that means is that to stop climate change, we actually have to stop emitting carbon dioxide. It's not just we have to cut down, eventually we have to emit zero carbon dioxide. And that was a pretty scary thought. At about 22, so I'd finished university and I hadn't really studied anything to do with climate change, um, I decided that I wanted to go back to university and I wanted to fix that. I wanted to go back and do a PhD and try and learn something new about climate change that could maybe help the world in some tiny way. So it's when I went back to university to do a PhD in atmospheric physics that my learning about climate change, understandably, like went right off the charts. So probably the first thing I learned was why scientists are so sure. I'd not really learned the proper science about climate change before, but now that I did, it made so much sense uh, seeing that the warming pattern we've observed matches really well what you'd expect for carbon dioxide. And if we don't take carbon dioxide into account, we basically can't explain what we've seen happen in the world. But it's not just the warming pattern, it's also how rainfall's changing, it's how different parts of the world are warming, it's how days and nights are warming differently. So I suddenly got it, all these fingerprints, as climate scientists call them, are pointing to one particular culprit that's behind this warming, and that culprit is carbon dioxide. That's why everyone's so sure about this. I already knew at that point that there was this huge disconnect between where the science is at and where public discussions and policy discussions are at. But there's nothing like actually studying CO2 and meeting loads of climate scientists to really ram that point home. The other thing that really rammed that point home was comparing what was actually happening to the world's emissions to what should be happening to the world's emissions if we are gonna keep uh, global warming under two degrees, which lots of people at the time were saying was what we needed to do. And the thing was, they were heading in opposite directions. As far as I can remember, uh, emissions were rising at about 2% two, two, uh, a year, and they should have been falling at about 2% a year. I learned just how cool some of the science was. And one thing that really stood out for me was uh, studies on extreme weather and showing that some extreme weather events are made more likely by climate change. Um, and extreme weather always seemed so random to me, so it was so impressive that people were getting to the stage where they were able to say, oh, this event was made five times more likely by climate change, or this event wasn't really affected by climate change. I then learned two sort of opposite things. I was having more and more conversations with people about climate change, because when they asked me what I did, I told them I worked on climate change and then we'd have a chat about it. Um, and I realized that there are people in all walks of life who don't believe in climate change, or are at least a bit skeptical about it, or have heard mixed messages about it. Um, and before that, I thought only a particular kind of person didn't believe in it. But it was uh, quite eye-opening to see that you can never tell when someone's gonna be skeptical about climate change before talking to them. The other and sort of opposite thing I learned to that was that it's really hard to find a climate scientist who doesn't believe in climate change. I was going to conferences, I was seeing seminars, uh, I was meeting so many scientists, and you just never met anyone who said that the world wasn't warming and that it wasn't caused by humans. And that wasn't because there was some big conspiracy to shut people up. It was because there just wasn't any proper science suggesting that. I then had maybe one of the most life-changing conversations of these last 30 years. I met someone in a pub, they asked me what I did, I told them I worked on climate change. 
they told me they didn't believe it and they explained why. And I managed to explain the science that I knew to them and uh, why the points that they'd heard didn't actually quite add up. And they were like, okay, cool, great, well done, you've convinced me. And I was just like, oh wow, not everyone is stuck in their ways. That was uh, probably at age about 25. And uh, at about age 26, I decided to make my first YouTube video about that experience, uh, and you can watch it, of course. Um, and uh, I was amazed that people actually wanted to watch this video of me asking about talking about climate change. That was a huge revelation. The last three things I want to talk about are all about different kinds of surprises, good and bad. Let's start with a good one. So I realised that countries can really surprise us. Uh, when I started my PhD, it was just so understood that China's emissions were skyrocketing, that China was going to burn more and more coal over the coming years. Fast forward to today or a couple of years ago, and people are seriously talking about whether China's uh, emissions might have peaked or whether their coal burning might have peaked. And this is just something that no one even contemplated when I was starting my PhD. Uh, a second good surprise is that even though it's really hard to make a deal about climate change, the world did that. The world got together in Paris and agreed that they needed to sort out climate change, need to limit global warming to two degrees or preferably one and a half degrees. Now this deal was definitely not perfect. I made a video about that. Uh, but even the fact that the deal existed was something that I hadn't dared to hope for and made me so excited at the time. The third and final surprise was that uh, countries can surprise us in not so good ways. Uh, they can really disappoint us. And that's been happening uh, watching America and seeing how much Donald Trump is trying to reverse uh, what climate action was happening in America. For the last thing I wanted to learn, I think I've got to 30. I had 30 written on my list, but I might have missed some off by accident. Uh, I wanted to say something about the future, something really grand, like I've learned that in the next 30 years, this will happen. Um, but I thought about it for quite a while, and I have no idea what's going to happen in the, in the next 30 years. I don't know what I'm going to learn in the next 30 years. Just looking at this list, so much has changed for me, for the world around me, um, some good, some bad. I really don't know what's going to happen in the next decades, uh, but I really hope it involves the world seriously cutting emissions and taking global warming more and more seriously and I hope you'll help in that process. That's all from me for now, uh, but happy birthday to me. Make sure to check out a previous Climate Adam video over here and subscribe down here if you haven't already. I'm about to move and also get a radical new haircut, so make the most of all of this while you can.